In this unit, we are going to learn some special interpolation methods in GIS. Before we do that, let's understand what special interpolation is. What you see on this slide are measurement points. So these are the points where we have some measurements. But most of the times in hydrology and water resources application, we are interested in continuous surfaces of variables. So spatial interpolation is an approach to create a continuous surface. So when we say continuous surface in GIS, we basically mean a raster surface and we want to create a raster surface from discrete points. And when we want to do that, we will use spatial interpolation. Another way of thinking about spatial interpolation is that when we want to create an estimate at a location where we don't have any measurements, we will use spatial interpolation methods to predict or estimate value at that unknown location by using measurements at known locations. So these are our measurement points that you see here in this yellow area. So what we have done here on the right is we created a grid or a raster and for each grid cell we estimated value by using a spatial interpolation method. Here are two examples. So on the left you see blue dots. So these are the points where we have elevation values and we use those observations to create a continuous surface or raster here. On the right you see ozone monitoring stations and the values at these points are used to create a surface. There are several methods available for spatial interpolation. So in this unit, we will only look at three methods that are commonly used. So the first one is inverse distance weighting. So what you see on the right is a grid. We really don't need a grid, but I have used it here just for demonstration purposes. We have three points where we have some observed values. So we, this is a point where the observed value is 12. This is a point where we have observed value equal to 15. And this is a point where we have observed value equal to 18. And let's say we want to estimate a value at this location X. So inverse distance weighting uses this expression. So ZX is the estimate at point X and the value at point x zx is estimated by using this expression which is basically summation of lambda times z so z is the value observed value so in this case 12 and that 12 is multiplied by this weight lambda added with observation at 15 and weight at 15, observation at 18, and weight at 18. And that weight is calculated by this expression. So in order to calculate the weight, you need to know the distance from x to these observations. So in this case, we have three points. So distance from x to 12 is d1, distance from x to 18 is d3, distance from x to 15 is d2. So once you know the distances, you can use this expression to find the weight associated with each point. And in order to get that weight, you also need to know this P, which is the power. Now, if you use a P equal to one, that's the simplest way. And that is the actual inverse distance weighting approach. But most of the times we use P equal to two. If we do that, we can call this method as squared inverse distance weighting. Because p equal to 2 is so commonly used, we just call it inverse distance weighting. Now you can see that this weight is inverse of distance. So farther points will get less weight, closer points will get higher weight with respect to x. Now similarly, if you use a value of p, the farther points will get lesser and lesser weight compared to the points that are nearest to point x. The next method that we are going to look at is natural neighbor. So natural neighbor also has expressions similar to what we saw for inverse distance weighting. So the prediction at point x 
is summation of product of weight and observation at any point i and this weight is calculated based on area so let's understand how this weight is calculated by looking at these two figures on the right in the first figure we have these three observed points first observation is 12 second observation is 15 and third observation is 18 so in this method what we do is we first create Thiessen polygon or Voronoi diagram for all the observation points so a1 is the Thiessen polygon corresponding to 12 a2 is the Thiessen polygon corresponding to 15 and a3 is the Thiessen polygon corresponding to 18 and we have given different colors to these three areas now we are interested in finding an estimate at x so what we do is we add point x to the pool and we reconstruct the Thiessen polygons and after we reconstruct the Thiessen polygon you can see that a1 got reduced and a2 also got reduced and this dark orange area is the Thiessen polygon corresponding to point x so the weight in natural neighbor is calculated by dividing the overlap of this new Thiessen polygon with the older Thiessen polygons associated with observation points so lambda i so in this case if lambda 1 is the weight corresponding to 12 so lambda 1 will be a1 dash so a1 dash is the overlapping area between the new Thiessen polygon and the old Thiessen polygon that was associated with 12 so a1 dash is this triangle that you see here and a1 dash divided by ax so ax is the area of this darker orange area which is this rectangle and then lambda 2 which will be this trapezoid divided by again the area of x and now you will see that a3 or this point 18 has no influence on estimate of x okay so lambda 3 will be 0 in this case so this is how natural neighbor works so as opposed to inverse distance weighting where the weights are calculated based on distances in natural neighbor weights are calculated based on areas and those areas are estimated by using Thiessen polygon before addition of x and after addition of x. The third method that we are going to look at is ordinary Kriging. So again you will see the equation that we are using here is similar to what we have used for inverse distance weighting and natural neighbor. Again the difference lies in how the weights are calculated. Now inverse distance weighting we use distance to calculate lambda and this is the same figure that we saw in inverse distance weighting slide. In addition to using distance in ordinary Kriging weights are computed based on distance and spatial autocorrelation. And the spatial autocorrelation is computed by fitting a semi variogram to the data as shown below. So what you see in this semi variogram is semi variance on y axis and distance on x axis and you will see that there is a spatial autocorrelation up to a certain point. So the semi variance increases up to the certain point and then it remains constant. So for this distance where the semi variance is flat we can say that there is no spatial correlation beyond a certain distance. So ordinary Kriging uses this approach to calculate weight. So the math behind ordinary Kriging is little bit complicated and it is usually used as a statistical approach for spatial interpolation. So we can think of inverse distance weighting as a deterministic approach and ordinary Kriging and its variations are statistical way of interpolating GIS data. 
As I mentioned, there are more methods and we are not going to discuss those. We will only use three. And since these methods are different, they use different ways to calculate weight. The question then is what method we should use. So one way to evaluate or compare these methods is by using root mean squarer of the interpolated surface. So what we can do is we can divide our observation points into validation points like you see here as red dots and these blue dots are our points that we will use for interpolating the data. So we will exclude some points from our data set and we will only interpolate by using the blue dots and not the red dots and then we create a surface. And after we create the surface, we can compare the prediction at those locations where we have these red points. So red point here is the observation and we find out what the predicted value is at that location. And we do that for all the red points and once we have those numbers, we can use this expression, which is root mean square error to find out what the error is in our interpolated surface. So whichever technique gives us the smallest RMSC, we can pick that method for interpolating our data. And depending on the variable we use, different techniques may give different results for different variables. So this is all for this unit. In the next units, we are going to use these methods and see how well they perform for elevation data.